Good evening. God bless everybody here. I'm so glad that I've been given this privilege to come and speak to you. I think that this year I, I've spoken throughout the United States and several countries uh, my story of how I came to God. Um, but this particular time, um, I believe that Satan threw every single obstacle possible so that I wouldn't be here tonight. And at first, I didn't want to accept the engagement. And I resisted like Jonah when he was going to be sent to Nineveh by God. And I began to pray that God would use me. And so I'm here tonight as much to speak to you as also to speak to myself um, and to be reminded about the miraculous power of God. How many of you here um, have encountered miracles? It's a good show of hands. We're going to be talking about miracles all throughout my speaking engagements in the next few days. And um, before I begin with my own story, I have to relate the story of other people that led to my own story. Um, you probably might be wondering why this guy is up there dressed in white with a bow tie on. And the reason why is because I am from Cuba. I was born in Plaza de la Revolución in the capital city of Havana. And tonight I'm going to be talking to you about pre-revolutionary Cuba. And um, I'm wearing a Cuban guayabera. And this is the way that the guayabera was worn before the revolution. So it was worn properly with a bow tie. The guayabera is a peasant garb that um, came to being in the 18th century in the province of Sancti Espiritus in Cuba. And originally, it was, war it was worn to be able to hold guayabas in the pockets. Now, I don't know how true that was because guayabas stain linen and you can't take the stains out. But it represents a Cuban flag. It has uh, three lines in the back with this small folds that represent the rank of that person inside of Cuba's society. And it has exactly 27 buttons. When this garb was taken to Havana, nobody wanted to wear it. So the Cuban tailors of the upper classes refined it, adding the bow tie and the French cuffs and the cufflinks. And it is now never actually worn very rarely with the bow tie. So I want to take you back more than 60 years to a very different Cuba. Before I begin, let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to open our Bibles so that um, we can invite the Holy Spirit to be here with us tonight. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing me here, even in part against my own will. Thank you for reminding me of your love for each one of us and for myself. I ask you, Father, that you send your angels so they can minister and open our hearts and so that we can see your mighty power all through this day's coming and that that power may prepare us for a future uncertain and may give us strength to face whatever challenges we may have in our lives today and in the days coming, knowing always that you are in control forever and ever because you have created us for your glory. Thank you, Lord, in Christ's loving name. Amen. I want you uh, to open your Bibles in Psalms 34. Lately, it seems like the news are getting worse and worse. And, um, you know, times don't seem to be so certain anymore. We don't feel as safe as um, we used to. I've certainly seen a great change during my own lifetime, and I'm only 35, which to many of you, I'm sure, must be very old. Um, Psalms 34, verses 17 to 20. And I would like um, for one of you to volunteer and come and read it to us. Anybody here that would like to be brave? Come up. Oh, come. The righteous cry. 
And the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them at, that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. So not one of them, their bones are broken. I'm going to set my timer because I've been known to speak for hours on end. And um, so I spoke five hours and a half once at a gathering without taking a break. So um, I have half an hour now. I've stolen some minutes. (laughs) And um, I want to talk about two different families. And tonight we're going to talk about the Carraleros. And the reason why is because these two families um, have formed the story that you're going to hear. In the early 20th century, a man by the name of Locadio Carralero had 28 children. Two of his wives died in childbirth, and the third one survived. Of those 28 branches, the Carraleros, there are over 1,000 descendants today. And during the earliest part of the 20th uh, century, um, Cuba was uh, a Catholic uh, nation, very thoroughly Catholic. Uh, In the beginning of the 20th century, Cuba was still a Spanish province. And um, many Cubans uh, considered themselves Spaniards. But a national um, character was beginning to form. And uh, Locadio Carralero fought in the War of Independence and um, established uh, many of his children to prominent positions in the province of Holguin and the oriental part of Cuba. That family was very ambitious. They wanted to found uh, different companies and businesses, and they wanted to prosper. So they began to marry well, and they wanted to expand their horizons One evening, a solitary figure walking in the countryside arrived at one of their country estates. There, um, the Yuraguana families, such as the Carraleros, spent half their year in town and half the year in the country, helping with the harvests of whatever they were producing. And this gentleman, his name was, um, his last name was Pupo. And uh, he had heard a message that had really touched him. And he decided to go to these farms throughout the countryside, to each farm to bring this message, the message of Adventism. And um, so he got to, um, to this estate late one night and asked to, um, for hospitality. At that time, the world was very different. And people were used to taking in strangers and having them live with them for sometimes months. So he gathered that family and began to tell them about the God that he had just discovered with the message of Adventism. Now, this was a very strict Catholic family. And they heard this message, rejected it. But in the family, there was a young son. And his name was Adelmar, and he was touched by that message. So he began to meet in secret with this gentleman and began to explore and open the Bible. And the Lord called on him, and he decided that he was going to be baptized. Now, he had a a great dream, and that dream was that his family would be united under that same message. So... He began to talk to his father, to his mother, to his grandparents. And little by little, the example of his life began to change his family's views on Adventism. At the time of his conversion, he was only 14. And within a couple of years, his entire family, uh, the branch that he belonged to, had converted to Adventism. Now, in those days, people married very young. And by the age of 17, he had picked a bride, and the whole family gathered 
to um, to be present at their beautiful wedding. And so there she was in her white satin gown in a country church full of all the carreleros. And the future seemed for all these people perfect, promising. And they were married, much to the great joy of the families. And some months later, his wife became pregnant. She gave birth to a little girl. Now this young man, he wanted to make his mark, and he wanted to make his own family prosperous. So he accompanied his father in many business trips, and many of these trips were done on horseback late at night to reach many um, of the other farms where they were doing trade. And, and one night, they got caught in a terrible storm. And when they arrived at the town, uh, Adelmar was very ill. And so he stayed at one of the houses of his family. And he got progressively worse and worse and worse. And his family began to despair and began to look for some doctor that could help. Specialists were called for. No, um, nothing was spared to try to save him. But the doctors didn't actually know what was going on with him. So he felt that he was about to die. His little girl was three months old. So he gathered all of his family, all the heads of those 28 branches around his deathbed in a house that was not his very own house, but that of some of the members of his family. And he entrusted, he entrusted his little girl to his family. And he said to them, I want you to promise me that this little girl will be educated within the principles of Adventism because when I am resurrected, I want to see my daughter and my descendants, and that will be my greatest joy. And so all his family members, both Catholic and Adventist, took a solemn vow to protect and to educate that little girl. And so that is how Xiomara Carralero, which is her name, begins to grow up around her grandparents and hearing the stories of her father, who passed away at the tender age of 18. And she was always uh, followed by the legend of her father's devotion to God and by that promise that he wanted to see her again and he wanted to see his descendants. And so she was educated and sent away to uh, Adventist school called the College of the Antilles. The College of the Antilles was a unique um, institution in the Americas. You could go from the first grade all the way through your college and graduate with your college degree at the College of the Antilles. And it was the only institution in the Americas where that could be done. It was famous throughout the Americas because it had a very renowned dairy, a um, group of um, German um, cows had been brought to Cuba specifically for that dairy, and it was like the most advanced uh, dairy in that province. And so the school took great pride in their dairy products, uh, selling them, and they were famous. Now, at that time, Cuba was a very different country than it is today. Cuba was a very advanced society at that time. It was the third greatest economy and the American hemisphere, a tiny little country by the early part of the 20th century, was producing more doctors than Britain. It was the greatest producer of sugar in the world and the third largest producer of rice. And its economy was rich and prosperous. However, Cuba, like all the other countries of the world, suffered many social maladies. And so during that time period, there was a farm nearby where another family lived 
that was well known to the carraleros. And in that farm, um, the owner of the farm was a Spaniard that had come to Cuba to fight against the Cuban independence. But he had stayed in Cuba and um, decided to make his life, and the Cuban government of the republic allowed him to do so. He was a prosperous farmer, and um, something, however, was amiss in that family. This was a time where social conventions were extremely strict, so ladies of those classes were supposed to go around with you know, ladies in waiting and a chauffeur and a fan and gloves and umbrellas. And they had to ride, you know, the horses, side saddle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this man divorced his wife, which was a huge scandal at that time, and married his maid, an uncouth woman who didn't ride horse, side saddle, and carried a gun in her belt. And this, of course, scandalized all of polite society. And they didn't want to have anything to do with that family. So the children of that union were snobbed. Nobody wanted to invite that lady to their soires or to their gatherings or to the balls or to the theater. And those children began to feel that snobbery very acutely and a hatred began to be born in the heart of those children towards the society that surrounded them. Now, little Xiomara Carlero was, would come over and play with these little boys and would get to know them. And she would invite them to the little um, chapel that her family had built, and they would come over to, see, um, to enjoy um, Bible studies and um, BBCs and um, all these different parts of the family. And the Carraleros invited them in to a certain respect. Now, one of the little boys would grow up to be Fidel Castro, the dictator of Cuba that would plunge Cuba into now more than 60 years of tyranny. And so she got to know this family, and um, her life continued on. And she went to the College of the Antilles, but when she went to the College of the Antilles, now as a teenager, um, that little boy, Fidel Castro, had been exiled to Mexico, and a civil war was beginning to brew. And the winds of war were beginning to gather. And one night... She was sitting with her grandparents in the living room of her country estate. And there was a gentleman on the radio. And they would love to listen to the British BBC. They were the best news. They had it in Spanish. And this gentleman was giving a speech. His name was Winston Churchill. And he was saying, Lo, an iron curtain is descending upon the greatest and oldest capitals of Europe. And he began to describe how wherever that iron curtain fell, darkness, misery, and evil prospered. The evil of communism. But communism was really far away. And old Europe, and Russia, and Poland, one by one after World War II, the great amount of Eastern European countries began to fall behind that Iron Curtain. And that evil began to spread throughout the world. But in Cuba, so far away, nobody could ever dream that communism could possibly cross the Atlantic and settle in that tropical paradise. So prosperous, so up and coming, so chic and glamorous. Now, something like that could not happen in such a happy society. And so she looked at her grandfather, who was listening to Winston Churchill, and she said, because she called him Papa, do you think that that Iron Curtain could ever come here? He said, no, not in Cuba. We're safe from that. We'll get the exiles coming from those lands, and they'll prosper here. But that will never happen in Cuba. 
We are a religious nation. We fear God. And communism is exactly the opposite of that. And so this young lady did not become any more preoccupied. Yet that little boy that had grown up with her, he had that seed inside him, the seed of communism. And when he came back from Mexico, he began to fan those uh, flames of war. And different aspects of communism began to arise. Now, by that time, Cuba had been under a dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista. And Cuba had had, up until 1940, one of the most advanced constitutions in the world. And Batista had um, stopped the constitution, and uh, he had dismissed the Congress, and he began to rule by his own will. Now, Cuba at the time was a very racist and classist nation. If you belong to a certain class, you shouldn't marry another class. If you belong in a certain race, you're not allowed to marry another race. And if you did so, you did that to your own peril. And this was a very strict um, atmosphere. And so Castro began to use those things. Well, we want to be free. We want to have a classless society. We want there to be no more racism. We don't want any more peasants. We want equality. And to all the Borgiosi youth that had grown up in romantic, reading the romantic poets, this was amazing. Well, of course we want equality. Of course we're all brothers. Of course. Let's join hands and join this movement. Now, Batista was a mulatto, and this immediately isolated him from the upper echelons of white Cuban society. And Castro used that very wisely to show that here was a man of that white upper crust who was going to be the savior of Cuba. And so he began to garnish power. He went to the university and married into one of the foremost Cuban aristocratic families, the Diaz Balarts. And with that union, he secured the support of Cuban society to overthrow uh, Batista. Now, in those uh, faraway provinces of the oriental regions of Cuba, all was still at peace. The country was beginning to rile up, and um, they couldn't imagine that true mischief could come of all this. Now, the directors of the College of the Antilles thought that everything would be safe. Most of the staff there were Americans. Um, and so as the years began to pass and war did break out, fear began to cover the entire island nation. During that time, Xiomara was sent to a little town called Caimanera next to the Guantanamo uh, American base because it was one of the safest places to be. Because as the armies of each side would come into the towns, they would commit terrible crimes on the populations, especially beautiful young women. So she was sent there with her family to pass the Civil War. And at that time, her family was extremely anxious that she should marry, and marry quickly, because uncertain times were approaching. At that time in Cuba, you obeyed what the head of your household said. So if you were told that you had to marry John Smith, you married John Smith, whether you liked John Smith or not. And so her family... Um, very much did a matchmaking and married her off to a gentleman who was not an Adventist, much to the chagrin of her grandfather. And so this young lady is suddenly thrown into a world very different from her own. And she begins to really uh, rebel and her newfound wealth. Now she had 
a slew of servants, uh, chauffeurs, the best clothes that could be brought in from Paris and all the other European capitals, jewelry that she had never worn, and things that she had never had. And the simplicity of those early years began to fade away. And she became a glamorous socialite. And during one of those, uh, the, during those years, she began a friendship with a Russian countess that had uh, decided to leave, live in one of the most remote parts of Cuba where she built uh, a castle. And she would visit this Russian countess in one afternoon the countess, having um, lemonade with her, looked into her eyes and she said, Xiomara, communism is coming to Cuba. I have run away half a world to escape it. I ran away from Russia, where my entire family was killed. I ran away to Poland, where I was persecuted. Then I went to Bohemia. And then I had to cross over the Atlantic to escape communism. But communism is coming. Late at night in the streets, people have begun to scream, death to the bourgeoisie, down with the aristocrats, death to the aristocrats. The very echoes of Russia that they had lived through almost a world away began to be heard again and this time in Cuba. And she said to Xiomara, you better start packing. You better start putting your jewels away and your money, and you better go. Because when they come, they will annihilate you. All of you will go down with this. And your class will pay with blood the injustices of centuries. And... Xiomara looked at her and said, <laughs> right, that's going to happen here, where my family is so well connected, where everybody owes us favors, where our name is a, a check in blank. That's never going to happen in Cuba. Our system is different. We're not like the Russians. We are far more developed. Our country is prosperous. We have an educated majority. That's never going to take off here. That's very sweet, but we're not going anywhere. So the war continued, and one day, Ramon Castro, Fidel Castro's eldest brother, arrived at the Urawana, which was at that time the house of Xiomara's aunt, uh, Cholin. And Ramon Castro, was an intimate friend of Cholin. And the Carraleros had done a great deal to supply arms, weapons, money, support, and intelligence to the rebels. And Ramon sat down with Cholin and he said, I want you to make your bags and go to the bank this very night, talk to the president of the bank, and remove all your money from the bank and get on the next plane to the United States. Because by the morning, your estates will be confiscated and will be nationalized by the new rebel government. And she thought, of course, that's impossible. We have provided support, money, sacrifices, even blood for this rebel cause. They will never betray us in this way. If anything, we will do better under this new government. For in 1959, Fidel triumphantly marched into Havana to the great majority and joy of the population because he had said, once I am in power, I will reestablish the 1940 Constitution. The Congress will meet again. We will have our democracy back. The Republic will be reestablished. And so everybody had supported him. Cholin said to Ramon, go home, we'll be fine. If anything happens tomorrow, I'll just write a letter to Fidel and everything shall be all right. In the morning, the entire state was surrounded by soldiers who came and told Cholin, 
comrade. It was no longer madam or ma'am or missus. It was comrade. Everything that you own now belongs to the people. Please get your purse and accompany us into town. And she was not allowed to take even her dog from that house. The entire house was inventoried down to the buttons and the pins and the pin cushion so that not a single item could be removed. Everything was nationalized by the state. And so this lady walked in shame because she couldn't get into her own car or allow her own chauffeur to drive her because now the chauffeur was a member of the people. They were not allowed to have any servants. And so a series of new laws began to emerge. People couldn't wear suits. The bow tie was removed once and for all from the Guayavera, a symbol of privilege and aristocracy. And so Cuba becomes a new country, a country where you have to remove your top button. And if you don't, you'll pay for it with your life. And at this time, persecution began. The very first thing that Fidel did was to destroy completely the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie class. So each house was inventoried. A list of forbidden books was made. And in that list were the Bible and all the works of Ellen G. White. And great pyres were made, and the population gathered to see all those works burn. Every library was ransacked, looking feverishly for the desire of ages, for the great controversy, for the Bible, and for a whole list of books that they wanted to erase from Cuba and from Cuban society. The next thing was to pillage all the churches of Cuba. The shrines and the cathedrals, all of them suffered. 467 years of culture began to disappear right before everyone's eyes. Every family was now a target. The simple fact of wearing a tie could identify you with the bourgeoisie, and that was enough to arrest you. And so a reign of terror began, and the carraleros began to flee to every corner of the globe. Today, there are carraleros in Australia, in Argentina, in Mexico, in Italy, in Spain, in the United States, a country that had never immigrated began to spread across the globe in this great race against this terror. And people overnight lost absolutely everything they had. Their bank accounts were frozen, all their goods. They had to leave their houses with their pictures and side of their picture frames, all their memories, all their belongings. The work of generations was erased overnight. Their estate, the Uraguana, had been confiscated by the, by the new government. And so they watched how they began to take all the livestock. Several generations uh, had served there to create this incredible amount of livestock, thousands upon thousands of cows. And it took an entire month, day and night, to march all those cows out of the Uraguana. Now, there was a special cow, Daisy. She had been given an American name. She had been brought in inside of a hat of one of the uh, keepers. And she, the, her mother had died giving birth to her. And so she was raised by the family. And Daisy was a pet. And the whole family uh, kept Daisy much like a dog. So Daisy would sometimes come right through the central door of the, of the house and into the living room. And so in the midst of this, one of the servants decided he was going to save Daisy. So he sent a telegram. And he said, Daisy is being marched off with the rest of the cows. So Aunt Choline got, you know, her one of her last nice dresses and her hat. And she walked over to the new government offices. And she said, you know, um, 
my cow Daisy is my pet, and I need to rescue her from this um, from this um, in, um, group of cows that you have taken off to the capital because she's not a, a regular cow; she's my own pet. And they said, "Okay, well, you can try to find her, but we're not going to help you." So she wrote to the next authorities and to the next authorities, and she followed the train where all these thousands of cows were being carted off to the capital. And in each province, this train picked up more and more cars until there was hundreds of cars carrying all these thousands of livestock. And when she got to Havana, she met with Fidel himself to save Daisy. And Fidel said, oh, yes. Go and save Daisy. Let's see uh, where Daisy is. So they walked her over to where all the carts were, and they opened them all. And inside of the carts, all the livestock had died. For it had taken weeks for them to be carted off without water or food. And Shalene got on her knees and started crying. She said, what have you done? This is the work of generations. This is the wealth of the nation. What have you done? Why are you destroying Cuba like this? Amongst those cows was Daisy. And like Daisy, every other part of Cuban society will be touched to destruction. Soon, Adventists were being carted off to concentration camps. They UMAP. We keep the Sabbath. We don't eat pork. We are eccentric. We are unique. And Christianity was the pillar that upheld bourgeoisie values. So it had to be wiped away, no matter what the sacrifices. And as different members of the family were being carted off, the ones that did not escape to concentration camps, her grandfather stayed true to his faith. Now, to go to church, you had to hide in the dark. You had to hide your Bible lest you be arrested in the streets. But he kept on going to church. He was an elder of the church. And one night, he gathered his remaining family, the very few that had not been spread throughout the globe, and he read those verses. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivered them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of broken heart, and save it such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of, of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. And he said to his family, Although we are in the midst of hell, hold strong to your faith. The Lord will deliver us. And as that was happening, he became ill. And as the weeks progressed, he got more and more ill. And they couldn't figure out what was going on with him. So they sent him to Havana, to a specialist. A little bit of family influence was still left, and they used every one of their connections to see what was wrong with him. He had cirrhosis of the liver, a condition that at that time could not be cured and that even today is very difficult to cure. And so Xiomara began to watch her hero, her pillar of strength, began to fade away. And as he got worse and worse, this young lady who had watched the whole destruction of her world began to have an increasing bitterness in her heart. And one night, after much prayer, He looked at her and he said, my daughter, because he had raised her like his own daughter, don't leave the Lord. Hold true to him. But she was becoming bitter. Her friends were now in concentration camps. Churches had been set ablaze. The entire surrounding atmosphere was that of horror. How can there be a God of love that could allow this? that could see with indifference the destruction of an entire nation, that could not intervene for his people, that could watch as they were being carted off into trains and to far, far away concentration camps. How could there be a God of love that could 
allow her one pillar of strength to melt away like that. And that bitterness and anger and fear grew more and more and more in her heart. And that night, when she held the dying body of her grandfather, who died in her arms, she vowed that she would never again pass through the threshold of a church. She would never again bow her knees to God, for surely that could not be a God of love. And she decided that that God, the God that she had known in her youth and her infancy, was not going to be her God. For this was a new Cuba, a Cuba without a bow tie, a Cuba without God, a Cuba without glasses, a Cuba where we were all going to be equal. And her heart turned to stone, cold and sterile. And after that night, she decided to become a different woman, a new woman, a woman that could survive in a society as cruel and as vicious as that new communist regime. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the story of that young woman, about what happens to her family, and about another very different family, a family that was still living in the old world. And they're coming to Cuba during this time of upheaval. And then I am going to lead you through this series into a series of miracles, a series of miracles that fulfilled that dying wish of a teenager who wished to see his daughter and his descendants when he would rise again with Christ. We're living in uncertain times. Before I close with prayer, I wanted to turn to 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And it says here, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will, will I rather glory in my infirmities than the power that the power of Christ may rest upon me. All throughout these months, I've been listening to a lot of things that have scared me. Things such as, let's make our country great again. Things such as, I and not we. And these things I have heard before, they're echoes from the past. Echoes from the past that were heard in Cuba and that have been heard in Russia before. And I wanted to read those verses to you because we are facing uncertain times. And just like that young lady, frivolous and the joy of her youth, and in a country where everything was possible and where everything was prosperous, never thought that such horrors could surround her. In that same way, with that same naiveness, we are now living today. Are you prepared when the day will come where they will knock on your house door. Are you prepared? So before we close for prayer, think. Think about this moment in time. You're being warned. I am that countess. The time is coming night. Prepare. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, We thank you for everything you do, how you strengthen our paths, how, Lord, you work through the centuries, through generations, to lovingly bring your children to you, how you rescue them from every problem, from every affliction, and how you visit generation upon generation because of your love for us. We thank you, Father that you have brought here, this group of young people, the future, the future of a world that's falling and slipping 
into an abyss of misery. We ask you, Father, that you fill our hearts with you, with your will, with your knowledge, that you prepare us to face the end, for the end is coming night. We're seeing all the signs. It is obvious now. We are surrounded with all the preparations. Help us to take this time so that when the time comes, we won't be only ready for ourselves, but we will be ready for the society that surrounds us so that we can spread your light in a time of darkness. In Christ's loving name, we ask these things. Amen. This media was produced by Audioverse for ASI, Adventist Layman's Services and Industries. If you would like to learn more about ASI, please visit www.asiministries.org. Or if you would like to listen to more free online sermons, please visit www.audioverse.org.